see you guys again. Saw most of you, I'm sure all of you, at the tour that last week. So um, it's good to see you guys again. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about Angar Corporation, what we do, uh, a little bit about our technology, what they do, how it came about, uh, talk a little bit about um, construction, kind of the construction photos, because you guys saw the finished product but really didn't see how it got put together. And then we'll dive into the meat and potatoes of what you guys want to talk about in everyday maintenance. And so what I did on the everyday maintenance is I provided the checklist. If you don't have one, let me know and I can pass another one around. Is what the guys on site go, to, go through on an everyday basis. Um, usually, depending on the site, it's going to be an hour in the morning and an hour in the evening. Unless they get a phone call in between that says something's down on the engine or something's not working correctly. Um, so we'll go through that checklist, and what I did was is I went to Edeline where you guys were. I took pictures of those certain items, kind of an overview, overhead view of where it would be located, and then a close-up view of what it is. So you guys can learn more about it that way. I figured that would kind of bring you guys to where those things are. If you stepped on site, you go, oh, okay, that's a chiller, or you, that's a gas meter, or something like that. So... Uh, we will get started. Um, our co company, uh, Angar Corporation, was located in Ferndale, Washington. Uh, we were established in 1935 as a strictly sheet metal shop. So we installed HVAC. Uh, back then it was called Van Sheet Metal. Uh, Andy and Gary, uh, since hence Angar, uh, bought it in 1975 and have expanded it since then. Uh, we specialize in all facets, facets of construction and project management. We've got over 100 skilled employees uh, throughout Angar in different, and basically what, right now we're probably up to 120 plus. Usually during the April through September are our busiest months. Um, and we've been proven to be a leader in specialty general contracting. Uh, that's what we do, building the digesters. That's what we call our, ourselves, SGC. Um, we teamed up with our technology uh, provider, DVO, back in 2001 to market, construct, and general contract their patented two-stage mixed plug flow digester. So when you refer to ours, it's a two-stage mixed pl plug flow digester. And then we're in the business of turning animal waste and other organic waste into profits for the owner and improving the environment. And then uh, you guys were at Vanderhoek Dairy. Um, that's the one that we went and looked at the substrate collection pit and uh, the nutrient recovery system. That was our first digester that we built back in 2003, or 2004, November 2004 is when it started. Uh, services that we do in SGC, we do grant writing through the USDA and REAP programs. Um, a lot of these projects, as you know, are very expensive, so any grants that they can get funded through the government, uh, we will apply for. Uh, we do feasibility studies, um, either for a dairy farmer or a third-party investor. We'll look at um, what they'll get paid for power, how much is the cost of the digester, um, what's their payback going to be, and then they can take that to either their bank and look for financing that way, or scrap the project because it doesn't pay. Uh, do all our full permitting. You know, each project needs a building permit, an air permit. Uh, in California, we need a water permit. Um, so we'll do all that. We'll do the utility interconnection correspondence. So um, setting up to the grid, we'll make sure that we get together with them, make sure that we have the right components on our side to tie into their electrical grid. We do the general contracting, of course. Uh, we also do the research and experimentation at Vanderhawks. We do that. That was that nutrient recovery system you saw. Um, there's a couple other items that we've done. Um, about two years ago, we did. We started doing air injection to lower the H2S. Um, that was something new for us um, on complete mixed digesters. They do that all the time, all already. So we said, well, why don't we do that? So we. Yep, yep, and it's that, the most corrosive 
um, to the engine and pipes and that kind of stuff. So we started doing air injection on that. Uh, of course, we do digester operation and maintenance, not only on our digesters, but we do them on others tech, other technologies. So in Idaho, we do uh, operation and maintenance on uh, two complete mixed digesters that are not our own. And then, again, we do genset operation and maintenance. States. So you, you, oh. build, you, build, you build a digester and set it up for the farmer. Yep. And then when it's all done, you guys provide a couple people and charge them to keep it running? Correct, correct. If that's, we'll offer full operation and maintenance. So we'll do the daily checklists. Uh, we'll be available by phone um, if the... Uh, so the farmer doesn't have to worry about that. Correct. Things. If that's... two guys or... Uh, yep. Yep, yep, and then they don't have to worry about that. Right. And then at that time, then, you know, we can either give them a guarantee on uh, uptime, so then they can go to the bank and say, okay, well, these guys guarantee that we're going to do 92% runtime, and uh, the bank can take that. And then we do the genset operation and maintenance also. Um, states we do it in, oh, go ahead. Yes, yeah, we would either do it on a time material basis or we'd provide a quote for them to do it daily. Yeah, and do everything. So gen set and uh, pumps. Same guys or different guys that do the gen set and the... They, it would be the same guys. Same guys. Yep, okay. same guys. Yeah. Yep. So you get cross-trained. Is it like hourly or is it like slack rate? Um, oh, how we bid it? We would bid it on our past projects, how long we've been on site. So some of the projects were on site for two hours, um, doing the daily checklists, and then um, some sites were on there six hours, like that 15,000 cow dairy in Idaho, uh, were on there about eight hours. And that's because there's so many separators to clean. Um, there's a lot more, three engines compared to one, and that kind of stuff. Okay. So. Um, so we service, as of this point now, Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. We have another office in Idaho at this point, in Jerome. And then uh, we just started the 1st of July uh, on Ginset service in California. So that's exciting. Which state county? Uh, we are based basically right out of Sacramento, so kind of in the middle. Yeah, so um, that's where we're at on that. Um, so our first project, you guys visited that one, is Vanderhoek Dairy, uh, built in November of 2004. They're producing, uh, install capacity was about 650 kilowatts, and right now uh, they're somewhere right around 500. And they take substrates and uh, manure. And then this is George DeRuder and Sons. It's our second digester. Uh, this one's located in Outlook, Washington, so right next to Sunnyside. He's about 4,500 cows, eastern Washington. Oh, okay. Yep. So uh, he is sized for about 4,500 milking cows. He's a flush dairy, so we've got to do some pretreatment before it goes into the digester. So on scraped dairies, you know, you're about 8% total solids. So it's basically into the collection pit, straight to the digester. On a flush dairy, you're probably around one and a half to two percent total solids. So what we do is, you guys remember the separator you saw at Vanderhoek's um, that the fiber came out on? Uh, it was a conveyor and then it fell through. Well, maybe not at Vanderhoek's, uh, at Aline. You had the roller press and then the fiber fell through. Well, it's basically a slope screen separator just like that. You take the rollers off because you want that manure to be as sloppy as possible. So all that manure will flow through a slope screen. All those solids will fall into a collection pit. Um, and then the liquid that's left over, instead of sending it to the lagoon because it's post-digest or pre-digester, instead of sending it to the lagoon, you'll send it to another collection pit, and then we'll take a portion of that liquid and mix it with those solids, and we can get it to about 6 to 8% total solids doing it that way. What's the add-on like that cost? Um, depending on the size of the project, you're probably looking at another 500,000. 500, yeah, so yeah, because you need a slope screen, you know, which probably costs you about 100,000. You're going to need a collection pit for the uh, liquid to go into so it can settle out, and then you're going to need pumps to pump it to um, the 
pre-digester collection pit where those solids fall into. And then you need a pump from there to pump it back into the digester. So. So why do you go with a system like that instead of like a centrifuge? It's proven. Centrifuge would take quite a while, wouldn't it? Uh, centrifuge, you would need a lot of them yeah. to handle the capacity for that. I think an average centrifuge is, what, 50 to 75 gallons a minute? Right. 100 maybe at the most. So if you're doing 150,000 gallons, you know, a day, yeah. you need quite a few of them, and the cost would come into place on that. If you were just put in a settling pond, how long would that take? A long time? Yeah. Yeah, what we're trying to do on that, that second collection pit um, is uh, some of those solids will settle out and settle down, so we're pulling at the bottom of those, bottom of the liquid and not the top. So we're getting a thicker material on the bottom also. So um, <clears throat> our third digester uh, completed in 2008 in uh, Hanson, Idaho, which is about an hour east of Twin Falls. And then we have one in Gooding, Idaho, started up in December of 08 for Big Sky Dairy. Qualco, which you guys said that you were going to visit um, in a little while, uh, we did that one. That one's in Monroe, again completed in 08. And then Farm Power Rexville in Mount Vernon, Washington. Um, that's our sixth digester that started up in 09. That is a community digester. So basically two neighboring farms pump to one digester. It's two 500 cow dairies, I think they were. And then Farm Power Linden. That one um, comes from one dairy farm, um, Dalma Dairy. And that was, uh, this is the project that uh, we take portion of the waste heat that we don't use and pipe it over to a green, neighboring greenhouse. Um, and then they use that heat to supplement their propane costs. How much of the, how much of the uh, propane are they able to? Uh, I think about 25% <laughs> in those if cold they, months. If they were selling the gas versus the propane to them, would that be more profitable than making electricity? You got to weigh. You would have to weigh that. You know, it's going to cost more to scrub it. You know, in your scrubbing technology, and you're probably going to produce more gas than what they can use. Because what do you do it with it um, in the summer months when they're not using it? So if we can supplement it that way with the hot water, and go through coils and radiate heaters, it helps out quite a bit. So. Which farm has the most? Uh... Uh, that is this project here, Double uh, A Dairy. Uh, this one takes fifteen thousand cows wow. worth of manure. Wow. Yeah, this one is uh, in Tillamook for Farm Power. They uh, completed that project in 2012, and then Edeline, of course, what you guys um, saw last week. This one's Rainier Biogas. This one, this project has that nutrient recovery system on also. Um, so they're stripping the ammonia and doing that. And then we have one that's completed. This is, this one's, I have under construction. Uh, this one's completed. Uh, this is actually completed. Uh, completed the first of this fall, or first of uh, this year. Um, and that's our 12th. So now I'll talk about traditional digesters, kind of the different types of digesters. So you got the complete mix, usually above ground tanks um, with a soft top that goes over it. And then you got your traditional plug flow digesters. Um, other than ours, the traditional ones have the, uh, they have the soft cover over on top of them instead of the concrete cover that we have. Um, it's a PVC or HDPE type material. Um, you know, lasting wise, you're probably looking at about 15 years on those. So a replacement cost. Eventually, do you have to get 
into those uh, on, a and clean them out. on a traditional plug flow digester, you would have to get inside and, and clean it up. Yeah, even with a lagoon, you know, you have a lagoon digester too. Those are popular in California because of the excess water they use. Um, they use so much water down there. Um, and again, probably you're going to have to clean those out because you don't have any mixing action in a big five million gallon lagoon. So, um, traditional digesters um, in the mixed, you know, your advantage is you get a waste stream between 3% and 10% total solids. And your solids and liquids are, liquids are always in suspension. So, you don't have the problem of items settling out in there. Uh, the disadvantage is, is you don't have the guaranteed retention time. So you, once they put the manure in, you know, it's above ground, so everything mixes together. Well, when it exits, has that manure been in there for 30 seconds, 10 minutes, 50 days? You don't know. So a lot of those, uh, after, they, after the complete mix, they'll either compost or put a bedding master in to get the the excess pathogens that they didn't destroy in the digester, they destroy in either composting or in one of those bedding master units. Uh, a typical plug flow advantage is you get a guaranteed retention time, so you get your pathogen reductions, good gas production, and you can take in a high solids content. Disadvantages, you gotta take in probably less than 11% total solids. Um, you will have solids settling out through that because you don't have any mixing in there. And then the other problem is, once those solids start to build up, you don't get that temperature from the heat exchangers throughout the whole entire system. So everything next to the heat exchanger is gonna be really hot, 15, 20 feet over, it could be 20 degree difference. So, and then now a little bit about our technology, and then what they go in, they're located in a chill tomb scob or Chilliton, Wisconsin. They're established in 1989, uh, founded by Steve Dvorak. Uh, he built his first digester, which is a complete mix, at Packerland Digester um, in w Wisconsin to take their uh, waste from the meat packing plant. Uh, they installed their first uh, two-stage mixed plug flow digester in 2001 at Gordondale Farms. Uh, by the end of 2013, both of us will have 83 digesters constructed and operational in the United States and internationally. Um, that would be about, yeah, 72 megawatts of installed electrical capacity, enough to power 43,000 homes. Yeah. Yeah. Do you guys have any we want to own the market yeah. and right now we own probably 60 percent of the market so with the DVO competition and competition? your competition is going to be the complete mix out of Europe um, you do have some plug flow systems out there they're slowly disappearing the regular traditional plug flows um, you know, when you go to our system, it doesn't have a whole lot of bells and whistles. You know, it's simple to operate. Um, so a lot of selling points for the Europeans is, you know, it's all computer controlled. It's all... So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's tier two. Um, and, you know, they have, they have a lot more bells and whistles but it also costs a little bit more, too, to have those bells and whistles. Um, you know, we've, you know, out of the 83 that will be up and running, they're all running. They're all operational, and that's our biggest selling point. You know, we don't have a digester out there that's not operating. So that is a huge selling point for us. That, that one that we went and toured was uh, 550 kilowatts? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the, that one with fifteen thousand. So is that like four four megawatts? Yep. Yep. Right and right right around in there is four megawatts. Now right now they're not at fifteen thousand cows. They're a little bit lower. So you're in the three and a half megawatt range. So, so and then also about the same amount of methane, even though it's it's it starts as a 
a flush instead of a... Mm -hmm. right. Yep, yep. Because so, you're getting as much solids as you can. You're mm -hmm. sending all the flow over those slope screens. Right. So you're going to lose a little bit um, if you have to spin off some of that water because some of that water still has you know a little bit of manure and urine in it probably. Gotcha. So, yeah. How does the power consumption by the digester scale with size? Like for the one at, at Vanderhoek, most of the power they can generate goes back into, or the first one we went to, yep. goes back into powering the digester itself. Mm -hmm. The big one in Idaho, yep. how much of the power has to go, how much of the power generated by the digester has to go back into? We average, no matter what size it is, anywhere from 6 to 10 percent total salt, or 6, per, six to 10 percent. Uh, power usage on those projects. So, so even if, if you scale up, your kilowatts are still scaling up. Right. So your percentage. So the kilowatts scale up the same rate. As, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one nice thing, you know, on those complete mixed digesters, your pathogen or not your pathogen, your uh, uh, power usage will be somewhere around the twenty to twenty-five percent on those. So what DVO did is they took the positives of a mixed plug flow digester and they took the positives of a complete mix <coughs> digester. So what they did is basically combine the two to make their two-stage plug flow digester. So as I said before, um, you know, the manure will enter in on this side here. So it's like a U-shaped digester. Travels all the way down here around that wall and then back out this side and exits. When it enters to when it exits, 20 to 22 days, depending on the size of the digester. And then during that, we have heat exchangers along that inside wall to heat the digester. And then also that mixing motion is on the inside too. It makes that corkscrew motion, keeps everything suspended. 55 to 60 percent methane is usually what we see. 110 cubic feet of biogas per cow per day is what we're seeing. Four to five cows equals a kilowatt without substrates. Add substrates in there, you're going to cut it in half. Uh, our gensets provide heat and electricity. Uh, like I said, low parasitic load, average 8 percent probably. I, that's what I always say is 8%. Some projects could be at 10, some could be at 6, some could be at 4, but your average is going to be around 8%. Yeah? What are substrates? Substrates would be the uh, stuff that we take in at like Vanderhoek's, inedible eggs, yeah. milk that they dump because the bacteria, or uh, they got a, a chemical or something in it, you know, that they couldn't send it to the plant. So, so that, that engine at Vanderhoek is running 92% of the day. Yeah, uh, greater than that. They're probably 98% uptime, I would say, somewhere right in there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so runtime average is probably around 92% on projects that we run. And then small amounts of H2S because of your air injection. Uh, so anywhere as they range from 200 to 1,500 parts per million. And then depending on what area you're in, Washington, Oregon, California, uh, if you're above a certain amount, then you'll have to add a technology in to remove that H2S or lower it down to what would be acceptable. Is there differences in what the, carrot, what the cows eat that can affect the H2S? Or in my opinion, yes. Some of, those, like, um, some of the digesters have higher H2S than others. Yeah. And, yep. um, and maybe it's just the substrates, too. Mm -hmm. but, uh, what do you think the, you say, who is, who is more on the high side on the uh, digesters that you're doing? Um, I think Idaho is probably a little higher. Mm -hmm. I think water has something to do with it, too. You know, some water has copper in it, you know, that's not treated, mm -hmm. you know. And, you know, some of those H2S scrubbers or, or they, I'm sorry, your water has iron in it, right. some iron, while a lot of those have an iron sponge to take out H2S. Right. So does that water help with that? It could. Huh. But I definitely believe that what they feed them does change because it differs from dairy to dairy. Yeah. So why is that? Why is it? Yeah. I would have to come down to those two items, water 
and feed. It's the Angar guys. They're saying they're around like only 100 ppm. At Vanderhawks, yep. Yep. Oh, Vanderhawks too. Yep. Oh, Vanderhawks is vi virtually zero. Huh. You know? And that's, that's yeah. Vanderhawks has always been the lowest of everybody. You is it because he takes in 30% substrates? Yeah, you know? Substrates? Yeah. Yeah. Because some of those substrates could be higher in, or what lower. About, or, what about Italy? They don't take in substrates, but they're really darn close. Are there, is their hydrogen sulfate higher than Vanderhawks? Um, I couldn't tell you that because I don't know okay. on that. I'm, I'm assuming they're probably a little higher. They, we do have to fit in those air permitting regulations. Yeah. So um, um, they don't have that technology. So I'm assuming that they're under that because we test it every day, part of that uh, air permit. So. Before I forget, what's the biggest generator you have? Uh, the biggest generator we got are the ones in Idaho that are one point. Six megawatts. Um, something happened. Oh, there we go. So, like I said, you know, your comp, your it's going to be basically your dairies are going to be flush scrape or vacuum. So, I explain the flush, explain the scrape. The vacuum would be that they have these vacuum trucks that either are a truck or uh, pulled by a tractor, and they basically have a squeegee type deal that goes along the lanes and then a vacuum. That sucks it up, puts it in the tank, they go over to a collection pit, dump it, and then we pump it in. Um, we also take substrates, pre-consumer food waste, biofuels. Um, our digester vessel is plug flow digester, first in, first out. We got the biogas recirculation system, and then we're a mesophilix, so we're right around 100, 101 degrees. So construction of the digester. So groundbreaking ceremony that we had at Farm Power. Um, those guys really like to do the groundbreaking ceremonies and invite people, especially <coughs> dairy farmers and government officials that you know either granted them uh, the money. You know, it's kind of a nice, nice way to kick off a project. Um, this was in Idaho. They got a lot of rock. Um, so this is the guy putting dynamite in the ground, explosives, which was pretty cool on one of our sites. Um, I wanted them to take a video when he blew it up, but we never got to that point, which would be kind of cool to show. Um, so basically, uh, he's laying the dynamite there, um, and he had to excavate part of that. Uh, I don't know what he uses, yeah. So basically, excavation of our digester in Tillamook. Um, excavation depth, you know, like at Edeline, 10 feet of it is out of the ground. Reason being is because of the water table. Um, a lot of the digesters in the Midwest are the only two and a half feet out of the ground because their water table is a lot lower. Um, so when it's two and a half feet, it's kind of nice. You don't have to do the berm, that kind of stuff. So based on the geotechnical report of what kind of dirt it is, uh, is there rock there? Um, what's the stability of the ground? Um, that's what they're going to do. They're going to dig it to what specifications of what they are, and then our concrete is based on um, what uh, that geotech comes back at. So that will determine, you know, as, after excavation, that will determine, well, do we have to put rock in? How much do we have to compact it? Uh, and that, that kind of stuff. A lot of rebar that goes in the floor. I saw those guys laying rebar. All those little squares are probably two foot on center. So that's a lot of rebar that goes in there. They're pouring it now. Uh, these guys are pretty fast, depending on the size of the digester. Like that one at Edeline, they poured the floor in the day, in a day. Um, rebar and everything? Well, the, no, okay. just pouring the concrete. No, rebar, rebar takes a little bit. You got a lot of guys running around, especially when you, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of uprights, um, you know, for the walls to come up. Uh, one thing that we do here, um, see that plastic membrane material? Basically, it's a water seal. So what we'll do is when they're pouring the floor, they'll stick that in there, six inches. And so when the wall's poured, you have a joint that's sealed. Is that this clean or something? Um, it is a green streak product. Um, 
flexible vinyl or flexible rubber material is basically what it is. Finished floor, that's the finished floor for that digester in that 15,000 cow digester in uh, Idaho. So then they come in and then they put all those uprights in. Again, a lot of rebar. So, and depending on the geo test report, tells you, well, do we need to change rebar? Do we need bigger size? Do we need closer together? Um, and that kind of stuff. So basically what they do is they'll lay, they'll tie all the rebar down on the ground flat on some two by four blocking. Then they take the crane, hook it, flip it up, tie it in and all together and then brace it. So that's how they do that on that. So then after they put those in, then they put these uh, concrete form panels in. They're heavy. Um, most, most of them are out of aluminum, but they'll crane them in and then they'll put them in place and then pour sections at a time. So each section that they pour, if they don't finish the wall, then that green streak material goes in that wall to make that sealed joint. There's the guys pouring concrete into the walls. Um, as I mentioned, we have put that four inch spray foam insulation on the side of the digester and on the top roof. Um, so that's that four inch spray foam insulation. Basically once the walls are poured, um, they'll spray that, in, spray that on so then we can start backfilling. I thought it was just for texture. Nope, nope, no. It's for uh, to keep the heat in. So four inch spray foam insulation to keep that heat in. And then on that top you get that, that coating, that gray coating you guys saw. That's kind of a UV protectant coating so it protects it from the sun. Birds picking at it, that kind of stuff. Okay, so you know how on the traditional plug flow digester had that rubber lid. Well, what we do is we put these, uh, depending on, again, the geotech report, you're going to have an 8-inch hollow core panel thick or up to 12 inches. Um, so these are the hollow core panels. Um, they span from the exterior wall to the interior wall and then from the interior wall to the next uh, exterior wall. Um, again, you got that green streak material to keep that gas seal uh, in there. So basically, once they lay those, they'll tie rebar to these joints here into the hollow core panel, and then they pour all that concrete together, and it seals everything. So again, this hollow core panel is going in. Again, you can notice where they stop pouring, and then they put that green streak in. Make sure that the joint's sealed. The reason they're hollow is to save weight? Yep, yep, yep. It's basically, those are the exact same product. Like if you go to a parking garage, uh, they, why, why you, those is what, that's what they use. And then they pour a lightweight concrete over top of it or thicker concrete over top of it to make it. Yep, yep. Um, there's the backfill of... Uh, that big digester in Idaho, uh, they start backfilling that. And then you see the mechanical building going up in the far. There's a finished backfill. This is uh, that Dry Creek dairy um, in Idaho also. See the water table is low in that, so we can backfill it all the way up to about two and a half feet level with the ground, which is nice, so you don't need to build ladders and, and you know, and it's you don't see it out of the ground, so it's less of an eyesore. Um, mechanical building in Idaho, again, that's that big dairy. Um, I think that one was 60 feet by 150 feet to house the gin sets and then everything inside of that. So in the wintertime, you don't see them for a couple, three months to cover the snow. What's that? The, you know, when it snows, you know, a couple of feet is yeah. snow, then you don't see them. Yeah. Actually, yeah, it's, it's some of them, you know, they do get the snow built up on top because they're so well insulated, you know, with that four inch spray foam insulation. Um, finished digester, like you saw at Farm Power. Um, here's a little bit of mechanical piping inside uh, the digester at Big Sky. Um, some more mechanical piping, like you saw at Elaine. Um, we do all that in house, all that mechanical piping. Yep. Yep, green is water, yellow is gas. So 
so that uh, flint condenser is for dropping out the water? Uh, that plate condenser is for heating the water. On the, the water drop out the condenser, how effective is that system? Like, how much water are you able to eliminate just by doing I don't, I, I don't know that offhand. Um, I know that it, each project's size to drop out a certain amount of moisture based on how much gas you're going to produce and how hot it's going to be, the gas getting to the thing. So that's, that's what I know. Um, those are those three engines at AA. That's that big 15,000 cow uh, digester. Um, we went with caterpillars on that. It was 3412 or 3416s? 3412s, I believe. Yep. And then those are the two uh, 750 kilowatt, or 710s, I'm sorry, 710 kilowatts in that uh, project in Idaho. Are those Spanish engines again? Yep, those are those Guascore engines, yes. And then, yep, the rooters. Um, so the power line's going out. Uh, so digester benefits. We could take substrates. She's gone, but, you know, that's restaurant, basically grease trap waste, cheese whey and milk, grain distillers, activated sewer sludge, uh, cannery waste. Um, we've taken waste from ravioli sauce plant in Bellingham, uh, silage spoilage, uh, dissolved air filtration from chicken processing plants, artificial crab meat, grass clippings, you name it, we take it. Again, like they said on site, any new product, we'll test. Make sure it's going to be okay in the digester and it's not going to kill it. Do you guys do that testing yourself or is that all? Uh, for Vanderhawks, they send out all the testing themselves. So, Because they're kind of in charge of all the substrates that are going from dairy to dairy. Right, but you guys don't have an in-house testing? No, we do not. Now, we'll test. We do have in-house testing for total solids mm -hmm. to do that. So we want to know how much total solids is going in the digest. So we have that. But you guys don't do that? The chemical composition. No, no, no. That's way above our pay grade. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, renewable energy. So we help, you know, rural communities. If we don't have power plants yet next door, near, they got to travel a long ways. We can help them by producing renewable energy and putting it back on the grid without having to add, you know, another power plant. They also get carbon credits. As I mentioned, that was another read another revenue for them. Um, uh, so the amount of methane that you take out, you get a credit for that based on a ton. And then you get um, that. Go ahead. How many tons of CO2 credits are generated a day? Um, I don't know that I haven't done it for so long. I do have um, a calculation. I could probably get you after okay. that. I, I could pull up one of my spreadsheets, and I think I have it on there. Okay. Um, get the separated solids after the digester. You know, you get the pathogen re reduction due to the plug flow retention time, your somat somatic cell count, and herd health because they're, you know, betting on digested solids, cleaner cows, uh, fertilizer, so you can use it as a peat moss replacement. They've done studies in uh, Wisconsin on the particle board using cow manure instead of wood and then pressing it. And because of the composition of the manure, it actually gets sticky when it gets heated. And so they don't use any glue or adhesive in there. Um, that, the process takes a lot of money. So because of the heat and stuff you got to use, uh, so has that gone to a commercial market? No. Same with plastics. Is that, is that a picture of the board? Yeah, you? that's a picture of board. So it's a, it's a particle board. Um, they've also done um, uh, plywood. So what they've done is the outside eighth inch on both sides is plywood. Uh -huh. The inside core is the separated solids. So we'll be seeing that in Ikea shortly? That would be awesome <laughs> if they want to pay for it. But, you know, so 
I, I see there being a market like that in Japan or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. What's it cost per board foot? I have no idea. Yeah. So again, separated solids off the up, off the pile. Um, the bedding of the animals, they like it. Some more dense material, soft, and then kind of it's kind of a spongy material, you know. When you squeezed it, it kind of went back. So it's a nice animal. No water to it at all. No, no. There's a little ammonia left in that one. It left in some of the solids, but not much. The manure smell is basically gone. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you know, for the benefits for the farmer, they're going into the lagoon at, you know, instead of when they'd scraped and didn't do any separation, you're going to go into the dige or into the lagoon at four percent, six percent total solids. Um, by going through the digester uh, process, you know, we'll lower those total solids about fifty percent, um, then go over separation. So you're going to be about that one and a half to two and a half to three percent total solids. So instead of having to truck it on the, onto the fields, they can irrigate it. So they save on trucking costs. So they already have the buried lines. So they can spread it on the fields that way. Uh, pH increases just due to the chemical process with inside the digester. And then they can apply it to the, directly to a growing crop because it changes from inorganic to organic. Or is it the other way around? Anyways, and then so it, the ground can take it up right away. It doesn't have to have the ground break down the, the manure and then uh, take it up in the plant, which could take up to a year to do that. Um, so that lessens the likelihood of runoffs into creeks. And there's a picture of them spreading the manure right on their crops. So they're having to use water. They're using that. Um, Again, like I said, nutrient management of the dairy. Um, they need to know what they're taking in for substrates because they can only take in so much nitrogen, phosphorus, depending on how much land they have. Um, when it goes through the digestion process, uh, some of the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium stays with the separated solids as it falls off and then the liquid. So they do get a lower percentage going of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium going to the lagoon. And then odor reduction, um, less odor when you're going, you know, a lot of people travel down the road and you see manure guns spraying. Some of them are really putrid. Yeah, why is that? Um, this, well, no, the smell it, on a, on a non-digest is those volatile fatty acids is what's in there, what produces that smell. And through the digestion process, we can eliminate uh, usually about 97% of those volatile fatty acids. And that's what produces that smell. So we can take care of that. The volatile fatty acids, fatty acids are just make up oils, right? Mm-hmm. So they're kind of well, in the in that composition they're more of the there's the ones that carry the smell in that. And then so like at uh, when they're using that ammonia sulfate they, what they did is on the right, you see where they didn't use the ammonia sulfate in the manure when they spread it. And on the left, you can see how it's darker green. They used that ammonia sulfate in that. So it's proven to work. All right, now we get into your meat and potatoes of your checklist. So everybody got one? Does anybody, I saw somebody, yeah, there you go. Uh, Vanderhoek, they started in 04. Oh. That one. oh, no worries. The one, Vanderhoek, we built in 04? Yes. Now, I mean, I don't know what the interest rates and all that stuff, but I made broke it even and made money. Yeah, their, their payback was probably about seven years on that project. Yeah, and then since they took in substrates, yeah, they're, they're definitely paid back by that. No. Uh, just a quick question. Yeah. Is this in any way proprietary? No. So can we, uh, so with this class here, when we put the stuff up on the web, is this something we can put up there? Um, no, I would say no on that. For you guys to take it home, I don't have a problem with that. The reason why is, you know, we put work into putting it together. Yeah. You know? That's why I asked. So, yeah. Posting it on the web, I'd say no. Taking it home and just taking a look at it and okay. shredding it or throwing it away. Or if you want to keep it, go ahead. Okay. 
air paper airplanes too. That's fine. Okay, so just handed out that checklist. This is the daily checklist that each of those guys go through, um, depending on the site that they're at. Um, again, they do it twice, so they do it in the morning and in the evening. So they'll go through, do all that. Um, what they'll usually do is they'll split those cells, so they'll write the top portion up here in the morning through, and then they'll, and when they go through in the evening, they'll write the bottom portion down. On the bottom. So that's the checklist that they go through um, on a daily basis. Um, basically, it covers everything that's on site that is that needs to be taken care of. So that first one on there is you got the oil temperature, oil pressure, engine water temperature, uh, and exhaust temperature. Um, those are uh, those are the gauges that you would look at to write those down. Um, and you also check the engine block oil level, make sure that it's in that green area um, right here. And then you'll read those gauges and then write down what you want. Or write what down what they say. Yeah, what you want. <laughs> Sorry. Whatever it means. Yeah, whatever. No. no. Do you guys digitize all of these every day so that you can study... You, like when, maybe which part of the year the engine's running, you know, when it has the most trouble or anything like, do you digitize that and study it so that you can go back and look at maintenance records and, and yeah. use that to... Yeah, yep. Yeah. It's all scanned in. Um, it's not... Uh, I think at Edeline, maybe that they, what they do is write it all down and then go to the computer and then stick it in all uh, in the Excel format. Right, like as far as an analysis to for looking at performance mm -hmm. of the digester and yep. seeing where you're yep. at after, you know, April 1st, 2005. Yes. April 1st, 2006. Yeah, definitely. I'm yep. assuming every day, like, Andy wants to look at these numbers. Yes. Every... Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah, because it tells you the performance that it's going to be. Definitely. And then you prevent a lot of the uh, problems that could happen. Yeah. You know? Yeah, you know, typical engine, you know, probably this one here was probably 550000 It's a big investment. You know, it's, uh, like I said, you know, at cost-wise, a lot of it's in your, you know, majority of it's in your engine, your utility interconnect, and your digester vessel. So the mechanical piping portion is pretty small. Now, what was it with the Spanish engines? They like they mm -hmm. run good on the dirty, or what? they run? They, yeah, they're not so finicky. Um, as Andy mentioned, you know they can run at dirt, different See, it's hard levels. It's hard to believe a cat is finicky, but yeah, yeah, yeah. caterpillar. Well, it, yeah, <laughs> they're getting better. Yeah, um, biogas. You know, it's it's different compositions. It depends on what the animals get fed. You know, so you're going to have those fluctuations, what substrates you take in. So for uptime reasons, that was why you would go with this engine, less finicky. Um, you would also, the, you know, the parts on these are cheaper than, if, cheaper than cat. Really? really? Yeah, yeah. And we can get them in the U.S. More of it. Yeah, yeah. So that's where you would find those gauges on that. There's a close-up. You know, of your oil gauge, uh, oil temperature gauge, pressure gauge, water temperature gauge, exhaust temperatures on your left. So you write down exactly what uh, they say. Now, this is the gauge wise. Um, I'll get into a picture in a little bit. Um, also, these are um, tied into the Atella monitor system. So when you go to that pan control panel, you can bring it up on that portion. I'm surprised there's a turbo boost. The, the that is on the telemonitor. Uh, yeah. Engine block, oil level gauge. Uh, got the sight glasses for that. Um, there's the telemonitor control panel which you guys saw on site. Um, that will tell you your engine hours to date, uh, your total kilowatt hours to date, actual kilowatt, and then what your current settings are. Yeah. How much does just that? Seventy-five thousand, probably. I would say. 
with the desktop system and the telemonitor system and the control cabinet wiring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't open it up for you. I should have took a picture of it, but it's... Oh, did he open it for you guys? Good. Good. So then again, your oil temperature, oil pressure, engine water pe temperature, digester pressure. The digester will all get on there. So your run hours... You know, it tells you, okay, from startup, it's 7,921 hours, number of starts, so 77 starts in that time, so it can be due to oil changes, uh, alarm failures, shutdowns from utility interconnect, um, and then the number of unscheduled starts. So that would be, you know, that's your total number of starts, 77, so if you shut it down for oil change, and then start it back up, that would, that would fall in the number of starts. Now, the unscheduled starts would probably be alarm failures, so it kind of separates those for you. So you have a total and then an unscheduled. <clears throat> then it gives you your KW hours to date. So since it started up, it's uh, almost 4 million kilowatt hours. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Very easy to do. Um, if we go to. Uh, that's a nice, nice engine they had over there. Everything was easy to get to. I think it was this slide. Yeah. Yeah. Everything's pretty open there. Uh, there's your fill. And then trying to see if I have another picture. It might be on the other side. There's an oil pump. That's basically uh, you flip the switch, push the button, and it pumps all the oil, all the oil out of the engine. Oh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so then it goes into a used oil tote, and then we have a company that comes by, I think Safety Clean or something like that, and then they come pick up all the used oil. Yeah, very convenient. You know, so basically. You basically come in, you know, shut the engine down, pump the, all the oil out, and take your filters, replace the filters, put new ones on, pump it back full of oil, start it up, and you're good to go. That engine room was like a clean room. Yeah, yeah. They, they take a lot of pride in the ones that we service to keep them nice and tidy. So the guys that, like, operate the machine, do they, like, wax them? No, we just make sure that you <laughs> make sure if you spill oil, clean it up. Yeah, yeah. No, you know, it's, we don't like kitty litter, is what we call it, the oil absorbent stuff, because it makes a complete mess. So we use oil pads. You know, soaks it up right away, it doesn't make a mess, you throw it away. No, we don't use Simple Green. Use that try stuff probably once Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, it's basically just be careful, you know, have a rag with you. So when you take the oil funnel out of, the, or the oil pipe out of the thing, you wrap it up in your rag and bring it over there and stick it on the thing. You know, it's, it's just those types of things that help you prevent that kind of stuff. Common sense. Yep, common sense. So, and then you'll get the actual power that's producing right now. It was 450. Um, 450 kilowatts. This and then, is from Vanderhoek? This is from Edeline. Oh. Yep, yep. And then in the parentheses over on the... Oh. Where'd it go? Right here. That is what it was set. That's what your setting is. So we're set up for it. Depending on the season and what they're eating. You're mm -hmm. If you're going to get substrates you... and that kind of stuff, you'll right. either bump it up or... Yeah. Yep. All be dependent on that. So is the computer really simple to use? Yes, very simple. Yeah. Very simple. Um, on those keypads, uh, basically to get to that, it's like three buttons. No. You know? And after yeah. a while, it just is it's, easy to navigate. Yeah, easy to navigate through those things. Yeah, definitely. Um, I could do it. So there you go. And I'm not a techie guy. So... Uh, so there's the water temperature, oil pressure, oil temp, 
Um, so you can make sure those gauges are working. And then when you write down on your stuff on your checklist, you would do it off of that because it's more exact. But you can make sure the gauges are working and going through that. Uh, digester pressure, uh, 1.61 uh, inches of water column. You know, you'll check that, make sure it's not getting too high. What's the, what's, so that's the ideal. What's, what's high and what's low? Um, anything above four, I would consider high. Because our release are set at, I think, six inches water column, mm -hmm. or four to six, depending on where they're at. So if it builds up too much, it goes up to, um, we got the safety relief flare, and then we also have our burning flare. That will go off. So oil reservoir. Uh, so basically when the engine's running, it gets low on oil, you don't have to add it the oil reservoir will add it for you. So you basically got to make sure that the oil reservoir is full. So if it gets low, that will add it for you. That's convenient. Yeah, that's convenient because then you don't need somebody on site all the time. Do these people have to, like, thought about designing cars? No, uh, you could, I guess. You could put an oil reservoir in a car, right? And some people go yeah. and like, run their car, like with oil, and they just run it and run it and run it, yeah. and they never change it, and it's just yep. terrible. Oh, yeah. Diesel, diesels are supposed to use a little bit of oil. Well, I know, but yeah. like, and just talk about cars in general. Mm -hmm. you know, like some people just run it until it's terrible. Yeah. Yep. So, and then again, uh, what you're going to check on that is the two sight glasses. Uh, you got the temperature gauge of your oil. Um, and then you also have how full that tank is by that sight glass. So, it gets down, you know, down towards the bottom. You just open that little fill cap up to on the left, add the oil to it, you're good to go. So, pretty simple. Uh, uh, next thing you'll check is all electrical control panels are fresh air ventilated because they produce a lot of heat. So, they're all ducted into this fresh air fan. Um, so, basically, you, you need to make sure that it's running because it's running 24 7. So, on the outside is a louver with little flappers on it. Well, if the flappers aren't open, then you know it's not running. Okay, what's wrong? Do I have a plug filter? Uh, is there no power to trip a breaker? You know, that kind of stuff. You look for that. Um, and then your filter box is right here. So you just make sure that the filter's clean. You know, if you checked it two days ago, do you have to check it again? Probably not. Make sure it's running. But then, you know, that third day or fourth day, you'll go through and check, was it blowing bad that day? You got dust everywhere? Is this the cartridge filter? Or yep, or? yep, just a media filter that goes in there. You know, use your common sense, you know, on that. And if it's blowing really bad that day and dirt's flying in those open louvers, those fresh air louvers, you're probably going to have a dirtier filter. So... Um, digester control panel, you guys saw that. Um, basically, that is digital readout of your digester header temperature. So that would be um, what uh, the hot water that's stored in that storage tank. That's the temperature we want it to go to uh, at to the storage tank. What degree we want it set at, and then as we mentioned, you know, each digester has different heating zones within the digester itself. Um, so we read. Uh, the different uh, temperature probes outside the digester and it relays it back to that. For this digester, we had five zones. And then on this digester, as we mentioned, we do have a pasteurization pit where we'll heat it up to 130 degrees for a certain amount of hours. And with that, um, uh, they qualify for those Class A biosolids. And then also your air injection. Um, gets uh, read out on that. So digest control panel, like I said, everything on that list is on there. Um, so basically gas zone, you can see that gas number on this panel right now, gas zone number four is mixing and there's 5.6 minutes left. They're usually about 15 to 20 minutes depending on the deal. 
uh, before it'll switch to the next zone. Uh, water header temperature is 135 uh, degrees. The heat storage is 152. Um, yeah, and basically your pasteurization pit's at 133, so you're above that 130 degree threshold. Effluent coming out of the, uh, before it goes into the pasteurization, or I'm sorry, the effluent pit, so after the pasteurization, is 129 degrees. So we're maintaining all through there. Gas boosters at 24.9 inches of water column for the engine. Um, there's the air injection setup screen. Um, we know our target CFM is 20, so that's where it will be. Uh, the next slide, I believe, will show you where the sensor is. So current CFM, 19.93 CFM. Uh, blower percentage, 28.7%. Um, there's the air injection sensor. Um, so when, when I was taking pictures, it goes anywhere it's from 20 to 19.2, and then back up to 20, 19, back up to 20. How do you guys find that 20 number just by trial and error? Yep. Um, yeah, we know you can only add so much oxygen to it before you turn it into a, an aerobic. Oops. Uh, Uh, me mechanical building exhaust fans, um, very important, especially during the summer that they're working. They're all controlled on a thermostat, probably set to 70 degrees inside the building. Um, so very important that they are working. Um, you won't have to climb on the roof to make sure that they're working. Uh, the next slide will show you from the interior of the building that make sure they're spinning. Fresh air louvers, make sure there's Nothing in front of the fresh air louvers, nothing in the building that's in front of the fresh air louvers. That way you can get proper circulation through there and back out. There's a picture inside the mechanical building of the exhaust fans. So if you know it's 80 degrees outside, it's going to be 95 inside the mechanical building. Make sure they're running. Proper ventilation. Um, what happens if you don't get good ventilation? Your engine will overheat. I mean, it seems like it could be more of a problem like in California than necessarily here. Yeah, and that's where you'll add more fresh air, more exhaust fans yeah. within that. So the more air circulation you got, the better. Um, Do you so, know what rating those engines are running at? Are they running at the light duty, medium duty, or heavy duty? I don't know. I don't know. That. Um, so on your... Next on your checklist, drain water from the gas line and valves. Um, so on this project and most projects, wherever the gas lines, um, we always have a drip leg basically that comes down on them. PVC will be connected and we'll get it to a certain location. It's always going to be condensing. So your number one thing is basically go to look where it's coming out of the pipe. If it's not coming out of the pipe, what's the problem? You got some debris in it. You know, something's going on. Something's going on. Uh, there's those two roots blowers that we were talking about. We always have one for gas mixing, and then we also have one for the gas boosting of the gin set. So, like we said, we come in at two inches of water column and bump it up to 29. So you guys go through a cooler. The gas goes through a cooler before it gets injected, so it's more... Correct. Right better. to the left of that picture, you can see just a portion of those plate coolers. Mm -hmm. So gas cooling is going on one side, cooling condenser, water is going on the other side of the fence. So it goes through two, and then before it gets to the engine. So on those roots blowers, we always have two oil sight glasses, one that comes with the blower. That's that one kind of right behind that PVC hose. Um, that's the sight glass that we do um, that comes with the blower. Uh, sometimes those get kind of crusted over over time, or they get dirty on the outside or whatever. So we made these other ones with the PVC tubing. 
So then you can see kind of the oil level a little easier than doing it the other way. And it's easier to drain because we, you know, the drain plugs on those, you can unscrew. Well, how are you going to get the oil out of, it's going to go all over that plate. So we got it over there. You can put your bucket underneath, unscrew it. So that, that roots blower sucks the methane from the digester. Yeah, so basically. And it, there's no vent on the end of the day. It just keep. No, it's, we have a safety relief, but you're only ta you're taking out through the gas line. Right. You're taking the uh, portion of that biogas to mix, but you're getting that biogas back right away because you're putting in, you're getting it right. back. And it's pumping. How much pressure is that before it goes into the engine? Uh, 29 inches of water column when it gets okay. to the engine. That's when the, that gas booster boosts it up. Gotcha. So, and you're what two inches water column inside the digester vessel. So really, yeah. yeah. Um, as I said, we do H2S testing. Um, so on the bottom of the gas filter, we put in our little nipple gas valve. Um, and that's our testing port location at Italene. Each project could be different, could be at a different location depending on it. Um, so we take our H2S levels, you write it down. Um, typical H2S tester, um, got the draw tube on the end, and it'll tell you how many parts per million. Uh, basically, you stick it in there with a the tube, pull on that, sucks the gas through. And then it will change the white colored sponge to wherever the H2 less level is. Mm -hmm. And you can get, you know, you have different H2S levels. You can get the little glass from zero to 50 parts per million. You can get them from zero to 1,000 parts per million. So. I wonder the red flags go up there. If it goes above what your air testing or what your, your design is on that. What happens then? Um, you got to call, make sure, tell them that you're out of compliance, and then either inject the air dosing or figure out something else. You know, what causes that? the H2S. Yeah. Uh, it's just the composition of the gas. What's one of the some of the bacteria in there actually generate H2S? Yes, yes. So like depending depends. on like the your bacteria makeup. You know. Mm-hmm. That is a Craig Freer question. Yeah, definitely. So if it gets too, let's say, part of it gets warm, the bacteria die, do they make the H2S or something? Yeah, the bacteria, when they die, produce the biogas. Right? Oh, I see. They part it constantly. Yeah, that's pretty much what it is. Right, but I mean, let's say, let's say part of the tank dies, the digestion, say it gets out of temperature. Yeah. And the... Well, not necessarily. I mean, no. because the te you're right in that the temperature range is ideal for certain bugs versus others. I'm not sure if you know, H2S producing bugs like uh, hard temperature. Uh, or, I don't know. I don't know what I did. Yeah. Well, I mean, they, they're all kind of a symbiosis, right? Um, the H2, the bugs that produce the H2S. Um, are necessary as well. They also help in the methodology, methodology, methane production. So um, it's always a certain way. Mm -hmm. So jet set gas meter, um, those are usually in line just before you get to the engine. Um, that will tell you how many CF, uh, yeah, CFM is coming to the engine, what the degree is coming to the engine. Um, and that's a portion that you write down on the deal. What's the date? Um, flare gas meter. You guys saw the flare outside. You know, basically that's where we locate it, right outside or right interior of the building. Same kind of setup. Um, you know, right now it's not producing any, so you don't you know that you know the flare is not on at that time because there's no it's at zero. And that keeps a running total, so you write that down. Um, so that was the digital meters. The flow meter itself is outside. Um, those were for the gas. These flow meters were for the manure. Um, so that is the portion that gets put inside, in line with the digester, or in, in line with the PVC pipe. So when the flow goes through it, 
it will send the, the um, readouts to the flow meter sensor, and that's where you will take the readings down uh, for your checklist. Now, Mike, um, let's see you've got two flow meters. Are you guys able to determine you know, how much of that stuff coming into the newer and how much is substrate? Since yes, that's the hence the two flow meters. Yep. So do all the sites have uh, two flow meters? Uh, yes. Yep, if they're taken in substrates, because you got to account for that. Yeah. Yeah, you need to know how many gallons you're putting in <clears throat> because, you know, to have that solid waste exemption, you right. can only put in so much, so up to 30% right. of your total volume. So, okay. yep. And before it goes into the flow meters, it all comes from that one, that one big pit. Uh, or that big salt pump that's trash pump that's way down. There. The one next to where we were, where the dairy and the feeding, right. that was for the dairy collection, yes. And then that other flow meter is from that collection pit that over time, though, will take substrates at some point. Not, they're not taking it now. So that right now it's getting metered in because they pump from their calf facility over to that collection pit and then pump it in. So again, it gives you the totals. And then if it's pumping, it would say 300 gallons per minute or 200 gallons per minute. But it gives you the totalizer and then you write that down. Uh, wash down pump, uh, you know where that substrate pit was or collection pit uh, next to the digester. Um, make sure it's running. Make sure you don't have any leaks, water leaks. Um, make sure it's powers to it. Uh, post digester separator, you guys saw that one too. Uh, that's the slope screen with the two rollers. Um, basically, you're gonna, there's the screen on the inside of that. So basically, you got to make sure on this one it has a wash down cycle. So after the manure shuts off going over top of it, you have a sprayer that goes down and makes sure that it basically washes off all the solids. Because if you see, you can, probably can't see it, but that screen has little slots in it. So the fiber will stay on top of it, the large particles of fiber, and the liquid will flow through those and that's what goes to the lagoon. The solids will fall out and they'll use for bedding. So you make sure that everything's working on there. Those are those two rollers. Um, the fiber will get um, built up in the corners. So you'll shut down the separator. Um, make sure that you clean all the fiber out of the corners so you don't have a whole lot of buildup. Make sure your rollers are clean, that they don't have clumps of um, fiber on them because what that is, it's all weight controlled. So if you have a clump in the left section, it's going to raise that section up a little bit and let more solids through and not get the much moisture out that you want. You'll grease the bearings um, on that. And then you're going to make sure that if that fiber pile underneath that separator is tall, too tall that, oh, OK, I better get it moved over to the side, jump in the Loader, move it to the side so you can have, so by at nighttime, or you come back and the fiber's way up. Uh, you'll check the sludge recycle pit and pump and the digester effluent pit. So the sludge recycle pit um, over time will form a crust just because it sits there for a little while. If, if you're not adding in, it could sit there for an hour or so you know, because what you add in comes out. So if you're not adding anything out, over time, the air gets to, since that's an open area, air gets to that top crust and starts to crust, and that will prevent it to, prevent it from wearing over. So you want to make sure that crust is not happening in there and clearing it out. Make sure the sludge recycle pump is working. Um, what the sludge recycle does on this technology is it basically takes, um, live bugs, as we can say, that's, that have gone through the process and we inject them back into a portion on the other side to kind of feed them, I guess, basically. Mm -hmm. Yep. I noticed that in some of the pictures, especially with the Spanish engines, you guys try to keep the buildings identical, keep the plumbing identical from one. Yeah. You know, it yeah. just saves on time yep. and material. Yep, definitely that. and. Um, we have a guy that's, 
here and we got to send them to Oregon so, yeah. to do something. Right. So whatever, wherever you have a spent one of those Spanish engines, everything's basically the same. Yeah. And the piping is pretty much the same at a Caterpillar facility, too. Right. You know, because the heat recovery units are going to be about the same. Some yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, a little close up of the sludge recycle pump. Make sure you don't have any leaks. Uh, make sure it's running. Powers to it. Um, yeah, the bearings. Make sure they're greased. And then, yeah. Is that a vein pump or? Is it uh, I think it is. It's a Vaughn, I believe. Vaughn pump. Um, and then, yeah, underneath those rubber mats are those grates that get you into that. You lift the grates out, and then you can stop, stand on top of the weir wall to get the crust out. Uh, digester effluent pump. Again, make sure there's no manure leaks. You don't have any seals that are going out, bearings, that kind of stuff. And then the chiller. It's located on that side of that building. Um, you're going to look at the site glass, make sure that proper water level is going in, through there. And then your controller, your sensor, that's where you control is set and do your set points. And then also tells you what it's cooling it down to. What size of the chiller do you need for the standard? Um, about 10 ton. 10 ton on this one, I think, or is it 15? Somewhere right in there. Now, if the methane was the same temperature as like the air, what would the engine run like? Would it run very good at all, or would it just even start? Probably not. Right. Just the, you know, the condensed, mm -hmm. you have more firepower that yep. way. Yep, you got it. Uh, next thing on the list was the heat recovery drain. Um, that's located in there. You know, we don't have that piped anywhere. Um, right now, we just have it going in a bucket. So every day, you're going to go through. You're going to make sure that open the valve, drain out what you need, and shut it. Bucket gets full, dump it. Uh, water fill tank for the after cooler in the engine located up on the top there. Um, you're going to go through there and make sure you check the gauges. So bottom left-hand side. It's got a full and a low, and then you also have the sight glass that you can depend on. So, also the water dropout boxes. So we put um, we put those in, and then you just got to make sure that they're full in the level wise, and that they're draining. You're going to look at the drain and make sure they're draining. Uh, flare again for that. Make sure that all your set points are right. You know, you have the, you basically have two deals. The photohelic is set to a certain pressure. So right now it looks like it's set to four to five to ignite the flare. Uh, right now it's at about 1.75 inches. So if it get in between that four to five, the spark igniter would go on and then light the flare. If that failed, we also have that timer to the right. So that's set for every minute it'll spark. So if that goes off, then you can rely on the timer, vice so that, versa. That thing reads the pressure in the, in the tank itself, in the digester, or is it? Yes. Right? Well, yeah, in the gas line. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That way you don't burst the fuel. Right. right. Yep, yep. And then make sure that the battery charger and maintainer sitting on the side of that IntelliMonitor system. So uh, make sure that it's working. It's because batteries are getting charged. Uh, and then your Ginset coolant filter system for your heat recovery unit. Um, that's where that's located on the heat recovery skid. Uh, basically, it's, this is a simple one. On the left-hand side here, this unit spins. So you know when water's flowing through it. The water should be flowing through it continuously. If it's not, you know you got a problem. I thought that that might be some little meter or something. Yeah. Nope. That's just. Yep. Just a sight glass sensor. You know, and then so many change. Then over time, you know, the coolant filter's got to be changed. So that is about it. So Mike, looking at this great um, checklist you've got. 
this would be perfect for an intern to go through every day and just uh, fill out for you. Yeah, so yeah. Any, uh, any need for uh, that? Interns we've got to... Well, that is not my call. Yeah. Uh, that would be <coughs> my manager, Brian Van Loo. Yeah. Yep. Contact Brian, and then he can let you know on interns and that kind of stuff. Because I know we've had interns in the past. So. Free but. Work. You can't beat it. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and other things too is, you know, we have seven different divisions with Inside Digest, or Inside Angar itself. I didn't really get into that. But, you know, we have um, the SGC area, which I'm in. You got uh, residential heating and cooling, uh, commercial heating and cooling, commercial <coughs> plumbing. Uh, we have architectural metals, some metal roofs on buildings, sidewalls, do structural steel, aluminum stainless steel fabrication, light gauge fabrication. So, so you guys probably build the, uh, all the buildings for the digesters? Uh, those are all prefab kits that we oh. get for those. All the process piping inside the building we all do. Yeah. Basically the only things we sub out is the concrete work, the foam insulation because we don't have the machines to spray it. Um, electrical. Electrical and then the concrete for the vessel. I don't know if I said that or not. But the con you know, sidewalks, mechanical buildings, concrete, that kind of stuff we do ourselves. <coughs> Collection pits, we'll do those. So, yeah. Yeah, like right now, um, we're looking for commercial plumbers. Right. Or swamped right now, we're looking for journeyman plumbers. So, that's another field that is growing, is in need of. That's so, what we've seen over the past is the tradesmen people have disappeared. They really have. And that's the backbone of our economy. Do you see any, um, is there anything you guys are working on kind of uh, for the next generation on these styles of digesters? Nutrient recovery was the big thing, you know, and that took a couple years to do. Um, you know, and that hasn't taken off yet. It's going to come to the point that 10, 15 years down the road, it's going to have to happen. Well, yeah, I mean, if it's, when you've got that technology, you just locked in they're going to require it. Yes, and that's, yeah, it'll come down. Yeah. It'll come down to it. Uh, other stuff, uh, you know, we're working on um, our first vehicle fuel project, I guess you could say. Um, we don't have a contract for it yet. Uh, it's still in the working stages of getting towards that contract, but that would be uh, in Sunnyside. That George DeRuiter and Sons project that I, yeah. that I showed you about, they would take those gin sets out, mm -hmm. and then uh, they would build another digester at another dairy farm, pipe them together, and then send it to a vehicle fueling station along the freeway. Mm -hmm. So that's exciting, you know, because yeah. that's something that we haven't done. Um, you know, we'd sub out the uh, gas cleanup stuff, yep. you know, but we would do all the other work. Yeah, there'd have to be a compressor somewhere. Compressor and... Sure, or Yep, H2S scrubbing and everything else, because you got to get to a certain. certain yep. Yep. Um, what about uh, flexible covers? Craig was talk, talking about how in California was like, um, you know, there's peak hours where you can make a lot more mm -hmm. electricity, and a lot of people are going to go like the lagoon style because it's got the ability to flexible cover mm -hmm. the lagoon to store a certain amount. Yeah. Do you guys have any plans on like making a floating roof instead of just like a hard concrete one, or um, making any adjustments for for making storage capacity in those systems? That has always been of a question that we've brought up to DVO, and others have brought up to DVO, and it's ultimately up to them if they want to change that or not. Yeah, they make those huge air bladders. Yeah, they make those. Like They're a little expensive, you know. Yeah. Um, you know that to do that's an, uh, again that's another additional cost. Um, lagoon covers are cheap. You know, you're basically lining it, or you're taking an existing lagoon, putting a cover over it, putting some PVC piping, and then getting it to an engine. You know, so the cost is way down. What's that? It's not insulated. It's not insulated. But in California, you know, where it's 50 degrees 
year round, you know, if you say it that way, because the winters don't get very cold. So it wouldn't be appropriate for this area? No. No, so it would not. Time. In my opinion, it wouldn't work here. Yeah. Summer months, yeah. July and August. Yeah, those are sweet. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, why they use them down there, down there and not versus our technologies, they use a lot of water. Um, they got an existing lagoon. You know, on our system, um, that's one of our, our issues is um, the excess water in California, what do you do with it? Because um, irrigation-wise, you know, such big dairies that they cool their melt. So they get a lot of parlor water that comes down from the, through there. A lot of them aren't air-cooled. Um, they wash their cows more in the dairy, you know, that kind of stuff. But mostly it comes down to irrigation. Because they flood the fields down there, too. They don't, um, a lot of them don't do guns down there. So if you ever went down to California and saw some of the growing crops, you'll see kind of like square sections. And they'll flood it. It's kind of got berms around it. They'll flood it. And then they move to the next one and flood right. it. Is that like Saturday? Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, definitely. But, um so, you know, like a, a system like ours, you know, all that water doesn't have a whole lot of energy because it's so dilute by the time you get it. So say they use a million gallons a day, which a lot of them do. So are you going to, you can't build a million gallon digester because its cost would be so high and you're not going to get that much gas production out of it. So where do you draw the line? So that's the big thing. So your basic idea is just using the water separation technology. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what we were working on um, on a project, but that one kind of fell through because of utility pricing. Is we would take the whole flow, and lot, all those dairies down there are flush. So we would take that whole flow of a million plus gallons and go over slope screens. Um, and then so we would get all the solids as much as we can into that pre-digester collection pit. And then after that, you would store it in a collection pit. And whatever you didn't use would spin off to the lagoon. So it would gravity flow, and you'd have a, you know, a pipe so far up on the wall yep. that once it got there, it would go to the lagoon. But you're going to lose some energy because you're going to lose some of that manure water that would okay. go there. So well, this might sound silly or something, but like in California where they use so much water, couldn't you take the methane and power a broiler or a boiler with it and then take that water and then make that into steam and then make a generator out of that? Yeah, you could. Enough, uh, no? Not enough gas to be able to get rid of that much water. I mean, just the yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Million yeah. gallons a day of water distilled. That would take a lot of heat, huh? Yeah. yeah. Ridiculous amount of yeah. gas you can put out. Yeah. Any other questions? You know, you guys got my uh, email address, I think. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. Well, thanks a lot, Mike. Hey, no problem.